Brothers and sisters, let us please give a special round of applause for the attorney at war, Brother Alton Maddox. I want to take the time to bring down a very special brother who takes time to give us the time. A member of the ASCAG Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations and a forensic psychologist. Black folks are just bad. And this is certainly a bad brother. Without further ado, I'm going to bring down our own Dr. Asa Hilliard. ancestors, the old ones, the recent ones, those that are in the close family, those that are in the family that stretches around the globe, those that are great and those that some call small. Because if we remember their memories, call their names, invite their presence, they will always join us, bless our efforts, nothing that we do can be wrong, but if we forget them, nothing that we do can be right. Ashe. Dr. Ben, our great elder, our true treasure, to Sister Keffer and Brother Bill too, because I know there are two families, United African Movement, the First World and several others. I know there are study groups all across New York and 
the surrounding areas and it's always good to have family gather together to think about serious topics and there is no topic more serious than the one that I have to address this evening. I was asked to talk about the education that our children deserve and the fact that it begins with us. Uh, you have to know that I'm first and foremost a teacher. I was trained as a psychologist and I learned my history the hard way. But what I really am is a teacher and I never forget that. And I never forget what it means to be an African teacher. That's different than what it means just simply to be certified and get a job in a public school system in America. What it means to be an African teacher is something that there is no certification agency to give you. It begins with African parents who are the first teachers of their children and who almost instinctively know exactly what to do. They know what to do to feed them. They know what to do to clothe them. They know what to do to nurture them. And it's on the record, it's on everybody's record, sometimes everybody's but ours. How good we are at this task, how long we have been good at it. It's well documented in videos and books. They've gone all over the African world to study how African people raise their children. And they've been to Uganda, they've been to South Africa, they've been to West Africa, and then they followed those Africans into America to find out whether the Americans remember how to raise their children and how to get the results that the Africans were getting when they raised their children. And on more than one occasion, I've talked about that uh, here in New York. I've talked about the children in particular in the study that was done back in the 50s in Uganda. And I've talked about those children because they have according to the Western test, the highest intellectual and physical scores ever seen. And right here at Columbia University, they study those babies and those mothers and those communities to find out why is it that even when sick, these babies outperform the norms of babies all over the world, all European babies, by weeks and months in both physical and intellectual tasks. And then they begin to copy and imitate those babies. I've talked about that here in New York on many occasions. Um, and they're still studying our babies. As recently as about 10 years ago, they did a film in the Cameroons and they studied the people called Baca people, who they call pygmies. And they followed this family for six months and the oil company made an ad out of the content of the study and asked the question in their ad, is it possible that people who have never been to school could teach us something about teaching and learning? And of course they asked the question rhetorically because they already had their answer that the people who they were talking about, these small people in Cameroon, who took their babies, mother and dad, sisters and brothers, aunts and, aunts and uncles, grandparents, those were the teachers, that when they assessed those children to find out what they knew, that all of the children had what they call an average achievement that you would expect to find in a very high level college or university had equivalent of a bachelor's degree. In terms of the level of sophistication of what they knew about their environment, about the medicinal use of plants, about the food uses of plants, about the closing uses of plants, about the names of all the plants in the whole environment, all the trees, all the flowers, and their functions the names of all the animals and their function, the classification of plants, classification of animals, the connections between plants, animals, human beings, and the spiritual world. That's awesome knowledge that every child has to have. 
no, no tracking, and no special education. That all children go in, all children come out, all must know all. The life of the people depends on educational excellence as an outcome. That's what we brought with us here. We brought primary education. We brought higher education. Just the other day, I was talking to Dr. Maiga, who worked over here at uh, Megar Evers College. And his wife works now as Vice President of Fellman, but turns out Dr. Maiga is the great, 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 great. That's about 13 grandparents back his grandfather was the king of Songhay. That's in 1493, one year after Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And he has persisted as a scholar in that family. That's the tradition in Timbuktu, Songhay, uh, in uh, Gao, in uh, uh, Jene, those university towns there. That scholarship has persisted generation after generation all the way up to and including today. He's not the only one that, can, ha, that has 14 years, 14 generations of pedigree as a university professor in West Africa. They're not the only one. And Mali is not the only place where that happens. It happened in Nigeria too. The Sokoto Empire, for example, was one of the higher education uh, demo sites for excellence in higher education. And of course, all of this rolls over from the Nile Valley, and you know that story of the Ethiopian Jagnas, and you know the story of Nubia, and you know the story of Kemet, and the great universities in those places, and the level of technology, the level of science, the level of theology, the level of philosophy, the level of literature. All of these, by the way, were literate cultures. So those who brag because they think we don't have a literate culture and call us an oral people only understand half of the picture because we're both literate and oral and we're masters at both. <laughs> and so we're very special people and if we raise this question, we raise it in a different way than other people raise this question. You know, what is the education that our children need? We raise the question different than Europeans would raise it because they came to this country and started a country in America, North America, United States, in 1776, if it's when it started, didn't have a public school system didn't prepare, didn't think that they had a mission to educate their young. And it was only after fights that they agreed reluctantly to educate the children. It was only after organized labor in Massachusetts demanded that their children get an education and only after Africans were out of slavery and into the legislature that legislators started an education system funded at public expense for every, every child. Africans started the public school system in the South. In Georgia, the name of the man who wrote the bill that became law, making public education a free thing, was named James Porter, an African, a personal friend of Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who was also the founder of the Republican Party in Georgia, and an AME bishop. Um, but Republican didn't mean the same thing then that it means now. But leadership meant the same thing then that it means now. And you had clear Africans who knew what their mission was and knew what it was that they had to do, and education was at the center of that. So when we raise this question, we raise it as a different group of people. There is a set of uh, a journal that's called the History of Childhood Quarterly. And if, uh, I don't know if you can even find that journal anymore, but if you could find the first four issues of the History of Childhood Quarterly, it's the history of how Europeans thought about their children in Europe before they came here. 
It's the history of their relationship, parent to child. The history of the relationship, community to child. And you had this widespread poverty and the sense that people were worthless, and so most people didn't even want children. It's the history of letters from dad to their sons and sons to their dad. And they read these letters and they find no love in those letters. They're passing information back and forth, but not passing their spirits back and forth. It's the history of people who practice infanticide, killing their babies because they got in the way, breaking their arm, breaking their legs so that they would look pitiful, so that they could beg for more and they could use their own children as a source of income. The history of people who hired nurses to come in and pretend to nurse their babies and then at night roll over on the babies of the mothers and smother the baby and then make it look like an accident. That's what the history of childhood for. That's not what Asa wrote. That's what DeMoss, Lloyd DeMoss, D-E-M-A-U-S-E. -E. That's what he wrote, documenting how they felt about children. You can see a clash of culture, can't you? African people didn't have that sense about their babies. Their babies were sacred from the moment of conception until delivery and beyond. They were spiritual, divine essences which deserved a particular kind of nurture to take them to a place that we haven't even imagined as of late. The goal of a public school education is far too low for African people. So we need some clarity in order to do this job. We need some clarity that comes from honoring those people who brought us where we were, who did in 1865 what we're doing in 2002, this evening. Africans in 1865 had been enslaved for a long time, but they never forgot that they were supposed to be in charge of their own education. And at the moment that they were free, they set up schools and taxed themselves so that they could run their own school. They did not ask or wait for the Freedmen's Bureau to do anything for them. They wanted to rule this thing themselves and they had a curriculum in mind. They knew what the curriculum had to be. And the curriculum had to be a heavy cultural education. There's a wonderful book called Web by Weber called Deep Like the Rivers. Deep Like the Rivers. And that should apply to the education that we imagine, because it certainly applied to the socialization that we imagine. And in that book, Deep Like the Rivers, there is a curriculum for early childhood education. It's how these Africans in slavery, this is before 1865, organized schools under the noses of their masters, and what they intended to teach, what was the aim? What was the purpose of education? We call them slaves. You can't call them slaves because you don't expect anything from slaves. They were enslaved, but who were they? Slavery was the condition, but what was their identity? Their identity was African, and what did that mean about how they raised their babies? That's the question that has to be asked. And when we ask that question, if you read that list of things in Deep Like the Rivers where they talked about what those mothers put together for the children four years old and five years old, it blows your mind. And one thing they were clear about before 1865 is they knew who their enemies were. They weren't confused about that. And they thought they were superior to their enemies. Think about that. They didn't have a low self-esteem. They thought that they were fully capable, fully competent. They understood that they were in what they thought was a temporary condition. It was only a matter of time when they could take charge and raise babies like the ones that they had raised that came over here on those ships in the first place. We need some clarity about this. Because when the discussion about objectives in education is being held, those discussions 
Don't count on us as if we're people who can design anything. As if we're people who already had goals. The goals are being set for us. Unfortunately, for the masses of our people, we have kind of forgotten that part that we played in the beginning, what we were doing when we had it on our own. And what we did when we resisted. You know, the Freedmen's Bureau, if you read history, they will tell you they came in and they built schools for us. They built miseducation systems for us. They intended to close the independent schools down. Every time we've had an opportunity to have independent schools, the outside system tries to close the independent system down. That's documented. It happened when the Freedmen's Bureau closed down those five or six hundred schools that Africans created that were African paid for with an African-centered curriculum. That's what they had. And the Freedmen's Bureau said, no, this is a government job. And let the government do it for you. And the government did it by changing the curriculum. Same thing happened when they were trying to do high schools in the early 1900s of the last century. And they had Booker T. Washington ask his mentor, Samuel Chapman Armstrong at Hampton, to have a study of the independent African high school, the one where people were scratching by on their own, trying to teach their kids something. And they put Booker T. up to it. Remember, Booker T. was Samuel Chapman's student, and that's why he was making Hampton which was supposed to be, I mean, uh, Tuskegee, which was supposed to be a copy of Hampton. And they saw him as their person who could get into the community and make requests for things. In other words, to invite a white person to come and evaluate the black high schools. And they did it, and they concluded that all those schools should be closed unless they, should, they could get a white board of trustees. So the record is clear. Every time we have an independent effort, the attempt is to close down the independent effort. I want you to keep that in mind as I go through the rest of the things that I want to talk about because Africans were clear at certain points in history. They were clear in the 1950s and 60s. They were very clear. At the time of 1954 when we had the school desegregation process, uh, there's a wonderful article that went in the Harvard Educational Review by Charles Hamilton called Race and Education, A Search for Legitimacy. And Hamilton began to wonder, as we should have wondered, we had some schools running. My dad was a principal of one of those schools. My grandfather was a principal of one of those schools, and I know what they wanted. I never heard my dad say that he wanted to break up the community and close the school. That's what happened with integration, though. <laughs> they broke up the community and closed the school. All, the only thing my dad wanted was money. He said, they got our money over there on the other side of town. And so we need the law change so we can get our money so we can do better what we already know how to do. Nobody knows how to teach our kids better than we do. We never thought there was somebody else that could do that. That's what he told me. And so 1954, when the school desegregation process began, they surveyed, this is uh, Charles Hamilton, he went around to all these principals like my father and others and asked them, what is it that you really want? And you'd be surprised to find out what they really wanted. There's nobody that wanted busing. Well, how did we get busing? Where did that come from? They wanted desegregation, but they didn't want integration. They wanted control of the curriculum, and they wanted an African-centered curriculum. That's in the record. Get, get the 1968 article in the Harvard Educational Review by Charles Hamilton, where he surveyed, that's the name of the article, Race and Education, a Search for Legitimacy, because they said what we want is a legitimate education, not an integrated education. A legitimate education. In other words, Africans had looked beyond the question of test scores and raised questions about the nature and character of the education process itself. This is a serious business. That's when we were still clear 
we become confused. We become confused about a lot of things that have to be clarified. Most of the people are not, and our people are not as clear as those who came here. If you're here, you're clear. You walk through the door because you were clear and you're trying to get it even more clarified. We know what we're up to in here, but this is not where the masses of our people are. I almost cried the other night. A mother from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, called me up and she said, you know, I heard you talk one time and I just want my students to meet you. And so if there's some way when we're up there for this ball game, we're going to we're going to ask you to come by, and I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to. Get this now, this mother who has no degree, getting ready to go back and get some, though, has 80 children that she brought with four mothers, one certified teacher, and some neighborhood mothers who love, and most of the kids coming out of the housing project, they love these kids. They wanted to show them Atlanta. They wanted to show them the big city and all of that. And so we had a chance to meet. If you could imagine, 80 kids in a suite. <laughs> See, this is a, suite's a big thing, but not for 80 kids. And I want to make the point about clarity, because as this mother went around talking about the sacrifices that she had made, because she had been abandoned and abused, and, and she'd been on crack, she'd been on a lot of things, but she clarified for herself what she had to do, and she now had a mission to save these children. She went through all of those things. The kids themselves were crying. And she said something about uh, the fact that she wanted to introduce me to a wonderful group of black children. And at that moment, several of the young people in the group said, no, 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 not black minority children. These are all African children in the room. But in their minds, they're not African and not black. They have bought a name that's a government issue, donated to them. They said, we want to be called minorities. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what this was all about. Except the fever, the Tiger Woods fever is sinking in among some of our kids. They're searching for any roots other than African roots. That's why I'm saying some people are not clear. And you can never answer the question about the kind of education our kids need if they are confused and their parents are confused and the community is confused about who they are. If you're confused about your name, you're confused about who you are. And if you will allow yourself to be called a minority, you are doubly confused about who you are, at risk doubly confused about where you are, deprived, uh, <laughs> you know all the names. So there are some clarity that we need. The clarity seems to me to be around several points. First, we're not clear that we're an African people. And we're not clear that we're an African people, even though we say it here in you say it right there, don't you? United African Movement. Everybody can look at that sign and say, oh, I'm not one of them. They know not to even be bothered. But there are people who are not clear, who are African. And that has to be clarified. That we're African people on the You know there are people on the continent that are becoming confused about whether they're Africans or not. They never left their, their villages and their towns. And the propaganda that's been beamed into them says to them, you're just a multicultural, you're just a human being, you're nothing special. So that's the first thing that has to be there. The education that does not result in a child completing or moving to a process of transformation where they are clear about the fact that they're Africans and that they're Africans connected whether they're on the continent or diaspora, they're African people. There can't be any, any, any confusion about that at all, but for many of our people there are. I worried years ago that at a certain, I, I had a, a little test I said, I said, what if you woke up in the morning the President of the United States issued a new Emancipation Proclamation, just like Lincoln. 
and said, as of this day, we're going to give you a choice to be whatever you want to be. For a 24-hour period, you can choose whatever group you want to belong to. And I said, the question that I'm going to ask is, how many would choose African if they had the choice? How many would choose to be African? They, oh, yeah, I know in here. But you know there's a lot of people that would choose something else. Even without the Emancipation Proclamation, have already chosen something else. I'm part this, I'm part that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Call me Cablanasian. <laughs> part Caucasian, part Indian, part every. So there's people who are very confused about that. The government tries to help by changing the census categories. Because the government has decided that Brazil got it right. That they should have been asking us to be whitened and for the country to be whitened just like Brazil made it public policy instead of segregation. That we would be weaker if we had been whitened but segregation left us stronger than we would have been otherwise because if they had chosen to propagandize us and to make us think like they tried to make the Brazilians think that they were really parts of numerous races. They got about 25 races in Brazil. 25 races or so, just by shades. And you can kind of go up in shades and get better as you go up in Brazil. Right now, I'm talking about it. Get Wind Dance's book on racism in Brazil, the Africans in Brazil and the racism in Brazil. Wind Dance, that's, one of the, that, that's an extremely important book on Brazil because you need that to understand what is getting ready to happen in America. You'll understand the Academy Awards if you read that book. You'll understand what happened in the Academy Awards. That wasn't an accident. It wasn't an accident. Denzel wasn't an accident. And definitely, Hailey Berry wasn't an accident. Because the propaganda is that if you get whiter, you get better. Okay. <laughs> See, you got to go past what's on the table and go under the table and decode what's under the table. Let's look at that just for a second. Just for a second. I'm talking about clarity now. There's nothing more confused than Monster Ball. I don't know whether you saw the movie or not. I hope you didn't, but I had to go see it because I'm a teacher. But I'll tell the story real quick. The story, I'm going to tell it by code, not by, not by minute by minute. <laughs> Just say what was in the code. Daddy's in jail, in prison, getting ready to be executed. Raise your hand if you saw this film. Okay, we do have some who saw it. Brother man sitting in jail, getting ready to go to the electric chair to be executed. He has two people who are kind of beating up on him, a father and a son. The son kind of likes him a little bit. And daddy is an old Ku Klux Klan type, redneck, hates him. And I mean, he wants nothing human to do with this piece of meat in the cell. Code. What that is, that's the one million brothers locked up. That's who he was. That's not the one guy there. That's the one million brothers who are locked up. Because Hollywood tried to send us a message. Hailey Berry, there's only two black male characters that have any prominence in this film. The other black male character that has a prominence in this film is her son. She hates her husband because of whatever it was that he did to her. And one of the things he did was leave her with a broken car, won't half run. And she also hates and abuses her son because he's fat and he's eating a whole lot, cold. The first man ain't worth, and the boy, that's right. Why? Because he's a consumer. He sucks up all my resources. 
Daddy can't help, and I'm out here all by myself with all this stress and strain. That's the message, so we got a woman now who needs to be rescued. Somebody needs to be rescued. The first, the dad of the prison guard is the one ultimately that pulls the lever that kills Hailey Berry's husband. Because the son couldn't do it. He said, you know you a punk because you can't pull the lever. I'll pull it. He pulls the lever, kills him. As luck would have it, he's the one driving along the highway after he just killed her son. She's on her way home in a car that he gave her and it broke down, further emphasizing the impotence of the black man. See, see? And so the white man, the racist white man, <laughs> is the one who comes to her rescue by picking her and her son up after the son got hit and he's critically ill. And so this one who pulled the lever and killed her husband is the same one, without knowing it, to each one who then takes her to the hospital with her boy. The boy in the hospital dies. So she's got to have a ride home. Who's going to give her a ride home? The man who killed her husband is going to give her the ride home. So he gives her the ride home, takes her to her house, where she could have said, thank you for the ride home, thank you for the ride to the hospital, but she doesn't say that. She says, murderer of my husband, come in the house. Listen to that now, that's the code. Murderer, come in the house, come in my house. Sit down on my couch. And they talk for a while. And then, can you believe this? The white male doesn't know what to do. And they almost cry and say, I don't know what to do. She said, oh, shoot, I'll tell you what to do. Give me your hand. Rub it all over my breath. Make me feel good. Listen to this now. Husband can't make her feel good. Black man can't make her feel good. Black son can't make her feel good because all he can be is a consumer. Only the killer white male can make her feel good. And then he leans over and whispers in her ear, I will take care of you. Code. <laughs> I'm the one that you have to come to if you intend to get out of the mess that you're in. He eventually finds out he's the one that pulled the switch and guess what? She stayed with him. Even after she knew. That's heavy duty code. Guess where that's going? All over the world. With the Academy Award symbol legitimizing it behind. And I understand NAACP gave Holly Berry an image award for the role. Do you understand something about clarity? That's not clear. Something is wrong. Somebody failed to understand what the message was. And they're so happy. Well, we just, this is the first time in 40 years we got an award. We should be happy. I heard white talk show hosts talking about we should have a parade. Newspaper reporter called me. I said, yes, we should have an observance, a funeral. Because they got the award. But I'm just saying, what kind of education is it if you got a 1600 on the SAT? You graduated and you can't decode that film. The question is, what kind of education do our kids need? Now, is Halle Berry one of the greatest actresses you've ever seen? Oh, she is, but that's the problem. That's the problem. She's so good at the role, she's going to make the world believe that that's the solution to our problem. Look at Denzel. Denzel, to me, is one of the greatest actors ever. But what did they do to Denzel? Go back one year. Go back one year. Go back the year before training day. Four great movies, right? He had Hurricane. But there were four movies about black men in that year. Every last one of them had an innocent black man in prison. You had Bait, you had Jail, you had Green Mile, and you had Hurricane. In all one of, every one of those, the man was in prison, and he was also innocent in prison. 
Two of them nominated for the Academy Award. There was no Toussaint there. No Steve Biko there. See? No Makandal there. No Shaka Zulu there. These are innocent black men in prison. They are the heroes of the film. One is a hero in Green Mile because he's sucking all the evil out of white people. In fact, that's why he's in jail in the first place. He found two little girls that were dying and he sucked all the death out of them. He said, let it not be in them, put it in me. Later on, he sucked all the death out of the white woman. See? See? It, nobody else got any problem with these codes but me. See? And then we come to, after four innocent black men in prison, we get the crooked cop. In the city where the crooked cops are not the black cops, they're the white cops. That's Los Angeles. They arrested half the police department out there in Los Angeles for illegal activity. But Dirty Cop goes around the world as an Academy Award symbol, carried by the weight of the Academy Award. The world sees us as those two roles now. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is that the night I saw Monster Ball, the black audience stood up and gave it a standing ovation. They weren't mad. That's what bothered me. I said, something happened to the socialization process, to the education process. It got out of hand. It got out of control. I don't believe that Hollywood could put on a movie where the actress would be in a concentration camp asking the Nazi guard to make her feel good and win an Academy Award off of that role. I don't believe that that would happen. But it happened to us, and we haven't had the outrage that we're supposed to have. I'm just talking about clarification. We have to have clarity that the fact that we're African people, that we are physically African, that's obvious. But what is not obvious to most of our people is that we're culturally African. And that's the part that ties us together. The cultural bond is what ties us together. We haven't been clear about that because the propagandists since 1750 have sent messages that said you are your physical type. That's all you are. You are your color. You are your hair, texture. You are your head shape, your behind side. That's who you are. And that's what you have to talk about, think about all the time. Oh, that's true. We are all of that. And most of that's pretty good. In fact, we always were very happy about that. We never had any problem with that. But what they don't want you to think about is Timbuktu. They don't want you to think about Kemet. They don't want you to think about uh, Nubia. They don't want you to think about Ethiopia or Kush, as we should call it. If you start thinking about those things, you'll think about yourself in magnificent terms. You'll say, how did I fall so low? I'm talking to people right now who say, well, we may have to do some sacrifices, but at least we'll be better off than we used to be. Instead of saying, how did we fall so low? Our people are educated to believe we would never hide. We have to clarify the fact that we have a location in time and in space. Most Africans are episodic people today because of the education process. They teach us to live in the present moment with the present event. We're an event-oriented people. You say something about black people, we start running the list of heroes. We got a long list of them. Well, a short list, because it's not nearly as long as it could be. We got a short, standardized list of heroes and sheroes. And that means we're captured in the event. Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, we could do a uh, man who did um, Washington, D.C. Benjamin Banneker. That's an event. Um, 
Any one of the events we could think about, the names we could think, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. We got little associations. The problem with that is we don't have a story. We have no time and we have no space. Most of the people that I see who are really on top of the world go back centuries, thousands of years, millennia. They say we are millennial people. That's what they say. And they make land claims based on their history, whether their history is true or not. And we say we don't have history. We're a group of people who just kind of popped up and we got the longest history of anybody on earth. Longest documented history of anybody on earth. Longest excellence history of anybody on earth. But we're not passing that history on because we are stopped in the present moment and in the present spot. And so we're shocked to find ourselves in other parts of the world. We're shocked to find ourselves at other times in human history. We don't know to look for ourselves in other places in human history. This is why the work that Brother Renoko Rashidi is so important, to go all over the whole globe. And every time you move a curtain, turn over a rock, pull back a door, there's a black face staring you back in the face. That begs a question. How did those people get there? How did they get there? What were they doing there? Some of the people who got there, these are awesome people. Can you imagine people like the ones in Micronesia, these Africans in Micronesia? I'm talking about the ones in Fiji. I'm talking about the ones who can get on ships and go 2,000 miles today on navigational knowledge that was passed down by their grandparents with no map, no compass, other than the ones that they have in their mind and the stuff that they wove together out of these little popsicle sticks and cowrie shells. Get the book, We the Navigators, by David Lewis. Get the book, Polynesian Navigation. Mama swimming through currents 40 feet, waves 40 feet high in the ocean, swimming for 40 miles with babies on their back, knowing how to get to the next island. You realize how awesome that is? Meeting a white-faced navigator coming, saying, my name is Captain Cook, and I'm sailing, I'm trying to get to Hawaii, and they come out to meet him in ships longer than his ship, sailing around his ship because he can't tack into the wind. They know how to locate themselves by looking at the clouds up above because they know that clouds peak over an island and so you can see clouds peeking over an island 20 miles away. When you can't see the island, you can see the clouds pointing to the island. They studied that. When you're out near the mouth of the water, the salinity changes in the water. You can dip your finger down in it, taste the water. You can navigate by taste. It's not so salty. It's getting fresh. We must be close to the river. You can watch birds. There are some birds, if you know who they are, these birds fly and go straight back to the island that they came from after they get their food. So then you follow the birds to the island. Then there's fish. If they're luminous, you can watch them in the water. And these fish swim and swim and swim. Follow the luminous fish because you know their pattern. They're headed back to land. You can navigate by fish if you know fish. Stars. You know that they navigate by stars, sun, but what about they can't see the sun and the stars? Then waves and swell. What if they can't see the waves and swell? Dig this, brother spreads his leg, senses the rise and fall of the waves in his testicles and steers by his testicles. <laughs> Can you see why nobody looks at Captain Cook with awe? <laughs> he can't sail. He don't know where he is. Brothers got to tell. I'm talking about Africans who produce excellence everywhere they went, supremely confident, and it bugs me to death that they lost that confidence and believe that somebody's got to help them. I want clarity. 
on time. I want clarity that we are a people of time. That means we are ancient people, deep like the rivers. I want clarity on space, that we are everywhere in the world, and we were there first. I want all of those things clear. And then I want clarity on what kind of value system we had and spread all over the world, the Maatian system that Africans spread. I want clarity on that. I can't hand this over to, what's your superintendent's name here in New York? Ain't y'all worried? Ain't most of the kids in New York City school system black? Don't y'all have a white banker as your superintendent? Oh, I thought so. Don't the people over there in Philadelphia have a white male governor, politician, who is not trained as an educator as the de facto superintendent of the schools for Philadelphia? Am I not right? And he's trying to turn it over to a business, <laughs> the Edison Project that you just kicked out of New York. Yeah, well, anybody from San Diego? Don't they have a white male federal prosecutor that's the superintendent of schools in San Diego? Um, in Detroit, that's a bad one. See, they always getting into the heart. I mean, these, the city I'm talking about now, Detroit, New York, that's heavy duty, conscious Africa. And you're gonna turn your babies over to aliens to educate them and lead your system. Isn't Los Angeles being led by a former governor of Colorado, isn't he superintendent of school? Uh, isn't the former governor of California, Jerry Brown, the de facto superintendent of schools in Oakland, California? Do you see a pattern or am I the only one that sees it? Do you know who was superintendent of those school systems in 1980, 1985? Who was the superintendent of school? Do you know what they did when they were superintendents of school? These Africans who were superintendents of those schools in Chicago, the mayor Daly, he became the de facto superintendent of schools in Chicago. Do you know what before these people became the superintendents of school? You know what they did? They had a school called, uh, a council called the Council of Great City Schools where all these black superintendents got together, called the publishers in and said, we ain't buying no books unless you take that mess out about Africa that you got in your books and put the right stuff in. Shortly after that meeting, I was at that meeting when the publishers came, some of them crying, because they had to, look, you realize what you're talking, what the publisher has to do is satisfy you in New York and then try to go out to New Mexico and sell the books that you like. That's not gonna happen. Shortly after that, we found that they got a formula for taking care of public education in America, hatched in the Heritage Foundation, sponsored by the Bradley Foundation. That's when you start getting vouchers and charters. That's when you got privatization and you got corporatization and, and uh, uh, money-making people coming in, running the school, raising the baby. Y'all, did anybody see the film Robinson Crusoe? It has some, some, a couple scenes in there I couldn't deal with, but at the end of the film, after being abused all film long, Friday gets to take Robinson Crusoe to his island where the black people run it. Robinson Crusoe don't have a job now because he was the master on this other island. So Robinson Crusoe come to Friday's island in his family, in his living room, and he begs, can you, you get the arrogance of this? Begs the elders. He said, look, I, I, there must be something I can do here. What can you do? I can teach the little children. Now, Friday been a pacifist all movie long. The minute that man said, I'm gonna take your babies and teach them, Friday went off. He said, not the children. Any job in town, not the baby. Don't give the babies over to this. You know what it was. I'm talking about people who clear. Friday was clear at that point if he hadn't been clear before. But I'm not talking about Robinson Crusoe. I'm talking about public education right now. I'm talking about being in lockdown in the schools just like the brothers locked down in prison. 
right now. Lock down with the curriculum that's going to be in the textbook. Lock down with the standardized tests that tell you what you got to learn or else you're not even literate. Lock down with a leadership that's totally alien. Lock down with businesses running whole school districts. Our kids deserve better than this, especially since we're the ones that know how to raise them. We raised most of the people who became president. Jimmy Carter had a black woman that raised him. Bill Clinton had a black woman that raised him. Yeah. They did a passable job, but they didn't have much to work with. <laughs> I want clarity about something else. We are defined by what we have made together. We are defined by what we have made together. We're not defined by our physical type. That's the beginning, but not the end. You got to have that peace, but beyond that peace, it's what we made together. What do we make? Memories? We're defined by our memories, our language, our values, our spirituality, our art, our music, our literature, science, our math, our technology, our architecture. I don't know how you felt, but when Brother Sam brought me down tonight, I said, I would have flown 24 hours to get here just to be able to do that walk. <laughs> just to be able to do that. <laughs> and see, I've been watching him all night. I watched, he did what Africans do. And I didn't see no sheet music down there. And I also saw schools over here. See, I, I know how to look for African schools. What's the school? The little children sitting there under the eyes of the master performing in a real place and very soon they're going to be like the master. That's African methodology that we don't even know anything about. And see, Africans, Africans got to know whether they're right or not. That's why they invent stuff like in... Um, the island, how many saw the movie uh, Sugar Cane Alley? In Sugar Cane Alley, where the brother lay back and say, yeah, he getting ready to tell a story, yeah, Cree. It, you ain't going nowhere unless people say, yeah, crack. They got to, in Haiti, you got to respond. Somebody wants to talk to you, you got to give them permission. And you got to keep giving them permission. Brother, give him permission. Every time he, hit the, he hears something that makes sense, I heard him almost knock Alton off the stage. It felt, I mean, it's strong. He said, that's a strong point. Of course, that's a weak one, but this is a strong one. Boom. That's Africa. This is serious. That's stuff we had together. That's why people shut the drums down. We came here with talking drums. Drums don't talk no more. They didn't shut them down. Missionaries said, you can't have that. That's heathen drumming. Get Carrington's book on the talking drums, or get some of the brothers to have their drum talk for you. I don't mean signaling drums. That's different than talking drums. Talking drums mean drums make sounds like your mouth. And you can pass the message from one drummer to the next drummer, and that drummer, and you can send messages 50, 100, 200 miles in a few minutes' time just by having the drums take the message and you, you can't you imagine British soldiers standing around in the wood and all this noise going on all around them and they don't know that messages are being sent all of a sudden somebody shows up and wipes them out and after about a hundred years they figured it out so they say you can't do that that's heathen because you can you got look at this how many different ways we got to communicate remember I told you oral written now here's the Here's the drum. There's the dance. We, we are, our linguistic system knows no bounds. You see, there are people who want to reduce everything to typewriter letters on a paper and call that literate. That's ignorance. Come to And then you call them illiterate.
even to ourselves and to our children. This is what we have as an African people. That's what it look, see, I can't even utter this sentence if we don't agree that we are one. If we don't agree that we are family. I can't even make this next sentence come out of my mouth right. It says, if we agree we're African family, then there's something that African family must do. It has an obligation for intergenerational cultural transmission. That's the family's responsibility. You cannot give that to anybody. That means there's some stuff that you can't give to public school. You can't give it unless you have a structure to deliver it. Listen to me now. We got millions of African children running around with no family telling them what to do and no way to call them to a place. Where, look at what we did. When we were at home at the right time, we got all the boys in one place, all the girls in one place, and then we went over, we say, we taking you now to a special place, to a sacred place, because there's a major aspect of learning that's getting ready to take place. You gotta be seriously involved. We wanna punctuate this moment for you so that this is not frivolous, this is not trivial. We got the baddest people in the community, the old folk, the elders are gonna teach you the most valuable lesson of your life. Are we saying that to all the children in the African community now? No, we've abandoned them and we expect other people to say that to them. There was a brother who wrote a book called The Choice out of D.C. Yeah, Sam Yet. Sam Yet tells a story, true story. He was in China and he got to China. He had heard that there was this one great philosopher in China named Mr. Wu. And Mr. Wu wouldn't see white people at all. In fact, he didn't see strange people at all. He didn't waste his time with anybody that wasn't worthy. <laughs> and so somehow or other, Sam Yeti, probably because he was African, they saw a kinship, they said, you can, uh, Mr. Wu said he's going to see you. Yeti was just shocked, completely shocked. So he went to do this interview with Mr. Wu. And Mr. Wu said, I'm going to do this interview with you, Mr. Yeti, but what I have to know before we do the interview, there's some things that's been really on my mind, and I can't figure this out. He said, now, you know that, that film series, Good Times? He said, yeah, we get that here. He said, yeah, I know, I know. He said, but that character, J.J., that really is not a black man, is it? He said, that is a white man that's got burnt cork, because we know they used to do minstrels, and so those are really, all the people on that show, those are white people dressed up to look like black people so that they can play those ridiculous roles. Isn't that right? And, and Sam said, well, <laughs> no, Mr. Wu, uh, those really are black people. He said, no, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. He said, I don't mean... <laughs> I know that they look like black people, but I've seen a lot of this where black people are made to look foolish and I know those actors can't be black. He said, Mr. Wu, I'm sorry to tell you, but they are black and we don't like it either, but they are black. He said, Mr. Wu sat back up in his chair took a deep breath, let it out, and leaned back in his chair and gave the signal, interview is concluded. And then he had this word to say at the end. Such a people will never know freedom. That's what Mr. Wu said. And would not do the interview after that because he lost all respect for all of us, including Yeti. Think about that. You're talking about hundreds of years, the kind of hundreds of years that we had as our asset that we called upon. We've forgotten what it felt like to be that arrogant, 
to be that self-conscious, to be that confident. Many of our people have forgotten that. If we were talking about education, when you go to schools and they ask you about your children, they prepare things for you, they have words that make it impossible to achieve what we need. They have language that makes it impossible to achieve what we need. I'm going to give you some of the language. And if you're a teacher in here, you know what I'm talking about. There's a man in Chicago that gave us language for the goals of education back in the 60s, 50s, actually. His name was Blooms. He wrote a book with Craftwall called Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. Prior to, he said, I'm going to do this because educators are too foolish, too simple, and the way they talk about teaching, they're not scientific, they're not systematic, they're not philosophical, they're not theoretical. So I'm going to give them language so they can have theory. So you divide your work up into three places. Cognitive domain, affective domain, psychomotor domain. All educations since the 50s in America have been in one of those three places. That's what they offer. Any curriculum guide, he gave them language. Psychomotor domain, that's movement, feeling, and the use of the mind. You already have left out over a fourth of an African curriculum because they got another domain. There's a spiritual domain. <laughs> It's serious now. How, how are you going to get what our kids need when people don't even have the language to describe what it was that we offer? Watch it again. If you're an educational curriculum writer, you learn to use the words, say the job I got to do in all of these domains is skills, attitudes, and understanding. That's, so my, my division of work is to produce high-level skills, to produce the right attitude and the right understanding. That's a serious problem for African people because there are some other categories that are supposed to be in there. For example, orientation, destiny. Can you imagine for African people no ori all skill and no orientation? All attitudes, all understanding, and no destiny, no, no place where you're headed. No value system that's driving. Do you understand what I'm arguing? Is that we cannot get the answer to the question of what our kids need from anybody other than from ourselves. <laughs> the problem that we have is there's a threat of abandonment by our community of our children because we have challenges. Every time you turn around, somebody who hasn't been talking to the family for a long time seriously will be easily misled when they walk into a school or they talk to a reporter or they look at something on the news. They got a whole bunch of African people convinced that vouchers are the answer to our problem. Oh, I wish they would give a real voucher. You know what a real voucher is? How much does it cost to go to an expensive private high school? Isn't it about $18,000 a year? Well, if they gave all the African kids $18,000 a year, that's a voucher. <laughs> then we could go buy some school. But they're talking about giving us $2,500 a year when the only school that you want to buy costs $18,000 a year, and they want me to grin and skin because they gave me the $2,500 poop butt voucher. We get tricked all over the place. And they've got Polly Williams out of Milwaukee. She was a representative. Do you know she was up there arguing for the Bradley Foundation that put that voucher mess out? You know the Bradley Foundation, the people that put out the bell curve? 
and they come to black people and say, we for you, so we gave you the bell curve, now we want to give you some vouchers. And Polly bought it until they finally used her up, and now she says, you used me up and abused me, and now you threw me away. That's what Polly is saying now. But they found, a, you can always find another Negro. So they found another one. They found Fuller, who used to be superintendent of schools in Milwaukee, African-oriented from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Now he works for the Bradley Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, and the Edison Project, selling poison to black people. And he got a wife doing the same thing, Deborah McGriff, used to be superintendent of the schools in Detroit, Michigan, selling the same mess. Cultural literacy. I'm talking about the challenges that we face. You get a man over here at the University of Virginia, and he and his friends sat down at the University of Virginia and made up the curriculum that everybody in the world has to take or else you cannot be considered culturally literate. His name, E.D. Hirsch. He works for the same people and the same foundation. Y'all got to get these foundations. Y'all all got these foundations together. Get this issue of rethinking schools. They talk about them a lot. Get Dave Berliner's book, Manufactured Crisis. He tells you names, dates, and places of people who are the enemy. Get the old Emerge magazine. When uh, they had Mayor Campbell on the front cover and they got the diagram of all these foundations that are enemies of African people all lined up in there, you need to know who they are. And they've already laid all of that stuff out for us because they're coming at us with all this poison. These are the challenges that we face because many of our people see that as immediate relief. That's an aspirin. And they buy into that stuff. They affirm that stuff. They vote to bring the Edison Project in. They vote to bring success for all in. Neither project, success for all and Edison, both say all we are gonna promise you is that you're gonna be better than those poor people that live next door to you. We will never promise you that you will always be average, and certainly we will never promise you that you will be excellent. We're going to promise you what's good enough for you black people, that you're a little bit better than the people who live next door, 5% to be exact. And there are people who will take that and vote for it because they're going to give them a computer. The teachers get a chance to buy stock in the company which has lost money in the company almost every year. I'm talking about the challenges that we face because we're not on the points that I've been talking about. High stakes testing, tracking, special education. Let me tell you something before I get to this last point. 20 years ago, 1982, I was on a report, co-author of one of the reports, for the National Academy of Science panel. Office of Civil Rights saw so many black boys in classes for the mentally retarded. They said, how come there's only this many black boys in school, but there's this many in the retarded classes? See? So they said, we need a scientific study on this. Did a scientific study on it. Found some things that were wrong with special education, wrong with testing. That report went out. Nobody read it for 20 years. Last month, 20 years later, the Council for Exceptional Children asked for another report. Now I'm going to tell you what happened. <laughs> this other report is a bombshell, especially if anybody in special education. This report says, throw IQ away. It's worthless. Wait a minute now. You had 80 years of IQ. And now you agree with Asa and Bob Williams and Bob Green and Tom Hilliard and all. We've been saying for 50 of those 80 years, plus Horace Mann, Bond has been saying for almost all of those years, IQ is a fraud. Now the Academy of Science says it. Go to the National Academy Press website, download the report. You can get it called Special Education and Gifted Education and Disproportion. That's the name of the report. Get it, because that's not all. Some of you know about learning disability. There are five and a half million kids in America that have, quote, learning disability. Learning disability means that you have high IQ and low achievement. You know the history of that? 
You know there was no special education to amount to anything before 1954? And then all of a sudden you had a 400% increase in special education that came with integration. In other words, you could move kids out of a segregated school and then resegregate them in an integrated school by putting them in special ed and putting them in a low track. And so if you were black, your special ed was mentally retarded. So that's when they found all these mentally retarded black people after 1954. If you were a slow white person, then they can't say you're dumb, so they say you're really smart, but something broken. So we're going to call that learning disability. And that keeps them separated. And then, of course, if you're rich and white, you're gifted. I'm, look, I'm not making this up. Read the report, and you'll see that what I just said is now fundamentally acknowledged. Now, black people want everything white people got. So we said, we don't want to be retarded, but they didn't say we want to be gifted. They just say, we want to be learning disabled. So now there's an equal number of blacks and whites and learning disabled. But the point is that they now said, not only is IQ no good, but that automatically makes learning disabilities no good. Plus, learning disability children look just like slow children. You can't tell them apart and they respond to the same quality of instruction. So why call them anything? This, this, is, this just came out in February, what I'm telling you now. They say there's a big fake going on about all these meetings about the kids, where you got the parent, the psychologist, the social worker, and all of that, you call that a team meeting. They do team assessment. Then you write a prescription, because teachers always want to be medical doctors. And they couldn't get into med school. So they write prescriptions for kids in special education called IEP, Individual Education Plan. Don't nobody teach that way. Now the documentation is in. Nobody teaches that way. And even if you did, it's no good. There's a whole bunch of bad malpractice been going on for 75 years, just got exposed. <laughs> Happened to be the same thing. Most of us called all of this stuff years ago many times. High stakes. These are the challenges that we face. What we have to do is construct structures. I always say that we've never failed. We never tried. You can't fail unless you try. <laughs> so you can't say we have failed to make schools that work for our kids. We haven't made schools for our kids to fail. I'm talking about the millions. I'm not talking about the ones that your kids go to. I'm talking about the millions of kids that don't have a fair chance. So we need structure. But beyond school, and this is the bad part, what do we need? What we need is a curriculum set by the elders for collective memory. See, there ought to be a legitimate curriculum of memory for African people. And the elders say, this is what you've got to pass on to posterity. We don't have that yet. Oh, we have the materials for it. We got people been dealing with this issue, especially in New York City. It had a whole lot of people dealing with this issue for a long period of time. We haven't collected it together and said, this is what the elders think we're supposed to give our children. We need clarification of our collective identity and we need bonding activities to make people fit with each other. You know, way back when I first started teaching, I taught in a Jewish community center. They went to public school every day, but every Friday they went to synagogue, and every Saturday they went to the community center. And what they did there was bonding. And then every summer, they spent six weeks in summer camp. And what that was for was bonding. All that, all that was history and culture, see? Because they knew that unless they tied people together with that bond, there would be no collective movement. We knew that at one time before they knew it. We taught them that in Atlanta. There started out one Japanese Saturday school, there are now two. 
Japanese people fly their kids in from Jacksonville, Florida. They fly them in from all, just so they can be there on the weekend to be Japanese, to learn how to be Japanese. They don't assume you are born knowing how to be Japanese. You have to raise Japanese people. There's a structure to make sure that every Japanese child gets exposed to a Japanese curriculum. To choose a culture, not just a color. We have to choose the way of life that we want to be. How we want to dress, we still have choice. People would make you think in America you don't have no choice. That you have to do it the way everybody else does it. Actually, everybody wants to do it the way we do it. Get Black Enterprise this month. Look at the hip hop culture and the billions that it's generating worldwide. And look at some of the brothers are even picking up a coin or two here or there, but they're not getting anywhere close to those billions because they got this culture. And the only place you can get this orientation is out of the hip hop culture. There's not another culture on the earth that can get the world's attention. It all started right here in New York, out there in LA, places like that. And it started from the people who didn't have the PhDs, hadn't even been to school yet, they were free. They knew that they had genius and they can talk up a storm. They just don't know in all cases that they are Jaylees and Seshes and Jaylee Musso, that they are Jagnas. They don't know that they are the great people of all time. Now see, I used to take kids in class and I'd beat them up for doing that, letting their phones ring and that's my phone, <laughs> letting their phones ring in class. But they don't, they don't know who they are. They don't know the power of the word. They don't know the value system that they can send out. They don't know the people that they can rescue with a word. We were just talking about it. Tupac say, my Nike, my Nike. Nike sales went up 15% just because he said it. That's what Al, uh, Mal Maddox was talking about. Somebody said, P. Diddy said something. Sales went up and he hadn't even had the contract. That's what, get, get Black Enterprise this month because they're going to have four issues on this phenomenon. If anybody else understood what we had, they're describing awesome power. That's what they're describing. And they're our babies. And many of us can't even talk to them. They are, but we don't know how to talk to them. And many of them don't even trust us. But they got a vehicle and they can send messages around the world. If they can send it around the world, they can send it to African people. If they can send it to African people, they can send the right message to African people, but they have to know the message. Elders got to tell them. We not talking. We doing something else. We got to build well. We got to build well. That's one thing we seem to be doing. There's a young man on TV and radio in Atlanta, and I'm, from the people calling in, it's the first time in my life that I've heard black people talking about how to build wealth, all the tricks of the trade for building wealth, and to do it in a collective fashion. We got to build health. <laughs> we got to take charge of health. Y'all, everybody, anybody read Fast Food Nation? Anybody read that book? I ate my last hamburger. <laughs> I ate my last hamburger. Now I don't know about the pork. Now I'm, yeah, I might have to take another six months to eat pork. <laughs> no, but get fast, get fast food nation. How cows get raised? How they have broken the food chain with the meat they're selling. Not the old cows. Not the free range cows. But when you feed cows, cows. When you feed cows, corn. You know, cows are not supposed to have corn. You're not supposed to have corn-fed beef. Cows eat something else. But you can fix it by grinding that stuff up, mixing it with some cow, dead cow brains and other things that have protein. And, and you can mix the corn and you can put chicken feathers and there's even a certain amount 
of crap you can put in it legally and still call it feed and feed it to the cow and the cow get fatter than any cow you ever seen and that's what McDonald's is selling it. That, get fast food nation so it won't be aces saying it <laughs> you see but I'm talking about health now because we got health problems like we've never seen before eight-year-old girls having their menstrual period breasts bigger than their mamas and they're 12 years old they feed hormones to cows see that's and to chickens too that's not just cows I just happen to be picking on cows but somebody got to talk about health to our children actually what's happening in my family my daughters are the ones talk about health to me somebody broke the food chain in our family before I got I got too old to learn and then my daughter pulled me up short and told me daddy my teacher said you are gonna die because look at you you sitting up eating this you're eating that and eating the other so she's she's the one that's got all the vegetarians in the family down there in Florida the control of socialization this is the biggest one the biggest thing that we have as a problem is how to gain control of the socialization process of our children back from the people who just stole it back again we're worse now than we were during segregation during segregation we had teachers in front of kids who loved them now that's not necessarily true now even the teachers who want to love them are terrorized by the way schools are run by being scripted people come in and tell you how to teach what to teach what to say and manage you and take your humanity away you can't do anything but be an inhuman teacher for the kids you can't be there for them when you are scared for your life and you turn into a robot and you turn your children into a robot we need to clarify who our elders are we need to clarify where our sacred spaces are we need to standardize our rituals we need to build language competency every African is supposed to speak an African language if you don't speak it now there's still time it doesn't matter which one you pick the one you want to spend your time studying you can study old comedic you can study tree you can study Yoruba you can study any of the languages people bind together by the languages they speak and finally in terms of structure we must build structures that guarantee the routine veneration of our ancestors that's one of the people one of the ways that we drift from memory is that we don't remember ancestors or that we have a little short list of ancestors that we remember and we certainly don't we've gotten so now we ritualize the great ones like Garvey and others and we leave grandmother and grandfather and aunt and uncle and cousin out and they're just as much ancestors to us as anyone else is but we don't have the value that we used to place on those ancestors there's not a night that I go or a day that I go without all day long reflecting on ancestors who are critical and important to me and what they've meant in my life there's not a day that it doesn't go by and I'm guided by what they do and I don't want to shame them in any way I don't want them holding me accountable at the judgment day and say man you had your chance with all we gave you and you didn't do what you were supposed to do but I want their faces in front of me all the time our children don't have their ancestors faces in front of them all the time because we haven't told them who their ancestors were or who they were as a people there is an education process for African children that's different than the process that they're getting now that's different than the process they'll ever be able to get in a process led by alien people the education process that our children need is nothing more than the one they used to have without a discussion about it where mom dad aunt, uncle elders made a total commitment to transmit the values and memories of our people 
to our children. After that, you can study your calculus. You can study your physics and your chemistry, and maybe even while you're doing that. But never forget the intergenerational cultural transmission process. Lister Belt Middleton used to say, sharpen your eye, tune your ear, so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. Thank you. Let's have another hand for Dr. Aza Hilliard. Well, everybody, thank you. Will everybody please hold hands? We want to leave together. After the message, the spiritual message from our brother, our elder, our teacher this afternoon, I just want to say in closing that we have been blessed beyond imagination tonight. We have really been fed with the spiritual essence of a future in terms of our education, in terms of the way we feel about our children, one another. It's, it's just marvelous. Brother Aza, thank you, man. Really thank you. We are an African people, stolen from our homeland, robbed of our culture, our legacy, our oneness, our peoplehood. But we shall rise, never again to fall. Up, you mighty people. Up, you mighty people. Up, you mighty people. No justice, no peace. Good night.